That was beautiful singing. Welcome to HBF. It's good to see you. Uh, we'll be reading from the book of Matthew this morning, Matthew chapter 1, as uh, we have a, are celebrating Christmas today. It's good to have you all with us. And if those of you that are back from college and what have you, it's uh, just good to see you in the house and uh, be uh, together this morning. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, familiar passage to most of us. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which, is being, inter- which being interpreted is God with us. And that's exactly what it means, God with us. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there is one in the seat rack in front of you. Uh, p- feel free to grab that, take it home with you, and be turned to page 543. As this morning, we're going to be talking about what God has given unto us and His Son, the Lord Jesus. At Christmas time, it's so important as we uh, remember Him that we remember the real essence of what Christmas is all about. And it's a great time. It's a joyous time to be with family, church family, um, and, and relatives, friends. And it's a great time to, in our culture to remember uh, Jesus Christ. And so if, uh, if you have a Bible this morning, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. And I'm going to be pointing out three things, three things that God gives us. He gives us not Santa, St. Nicholas, and stockings, right? Those are not the three S's I'm giving you this morning. But God gives a sign, and he gives a son, and he gives a savior. And have you ever really been in a situation where you're in distress and you're just like, oh, God, give me a sign, right? There's even some contemporary Christian songs out like that. I don't think they know 1 Corinthians one twenty two, right, where Jews require a sign, Greeks seek after wisdom. But even us at times, when we get desperate, we're just like, give me something. Give me something, Lord. You may have heard or even used the phrase, get a clue. You ever seen somebody that just keeps making the same mistakes over and over again? That's like the definition of insanity, Trying to get expecting a different result when you do the same thing over and over and over again. And you know, it's important that we, as we come this morning, that we, um, we look at this chapter, Isaiah chapter 7. It's a really well-used and well-worn Christmas passage. The passage we just read uh, where Joseph receives this confirmation um, on the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And his name, he gets his name, he gets his, uh, the meaning of what it's about. Emmanuel, God with us. Joseph would have known that in this distress, under the situation, um, he was looking for God to give him a clue. God, what is going on? And when he was told that, he would have thought, if he was familiar with Isaiah at all, he would have remembered probably chapter 7 in verse 14, where the Bible says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name. Emmanuel. Could you imagine if, uh, if Joseph had access to that scripture, what that would have meant to him on a personal level when he realizes he has a virgin that has a child and that child's name is Emmanuel. That would have been an incredible thing to consider and contemplate. And so as we turn to Isaiah chapter 7 and you see those verses, also we'll be looking at Isaiah 9, 6. Many of us are familiar with that. We'll look at that in a few moments you think about that, and you think about what they mean to us, right? Uh, because of the gospel, because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And then we celebrate Christmas each year, and we think about all that, and it's awesome, and it's joyful, you know, sleigh bells jingle, and, and we're just having a good time, and that's all good. It's awesome. It is good. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We should have joy, and we should be thankful for the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what's amazing is when you really take the time to apply the first rule of Bible study. Somebody tell me, what is the first rule of Bible study? context that's right when you look at the context in which god says this it's really amazing it makes you stand back and and really 
ponder a little bit about what's really going on here with this story of Christmas. And so I just want to take the next few minutes that we've got and, and talk to you about Christmas. And the sign that is mentioned here that was given to Joseph uh, was the one that was mentioned here in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In this chapter 7... It's really a chapter about a man that's in a mess. His name is Ahaz. He's the king of Israel. He is in the line of David. He's in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, through, uh, you know, through Joseph's line. Of course, he wasn't physically in the lineage because uh, he was born of God the Father. But he's listed in Matthew chapter 1. And so uh, we see that Joseph or we see here that Ahaz is in a real pickle. He's in a mess. And the reason he's in a mess is he's been worshiping the wrong gods, and he just won't quit. The same pagan gods that the Canaanites worshiped before they entered the promised land are the same gods that Ahaz has, has gone back to. I mean, he's just totally blowing it big time. And it's in that context that we find God coming to him to meet him where he's at. In the Bible, in Second Chronicles, an account of this man's life, just a brief snippet, says, In the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord? This is that king Ahaz. And it sums up his life. It's for he sacrificed on the gods of Damascus, which smote him. And he said, Because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, therefore will I sacrifice to them, that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and all Israel. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord. And he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem and in every, and in every several city of Judah. He made him places to burn incense unto the other gods and provoked to anger the Lord God of his fathers. And this guy was getting on God's nerves. And it's interesting that in this same chapter, this same man is the place we find this prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Ahaz was compounding mistake upon mistake, like a high interest credit card, man. It was just getting worse and worse and worse. And he was digging a hole that was so deep that not only that he could never get out of it, only God could deliver him. But yet he wouldn't turn to God. He wouldn't he wouldn't relent. He wouldn't recognize that God cared about his kingdom, that God cared about him, and he continued in his own way. And in the time of Christmas, unfortunately, you know, for many, Matt was just singing about it, sometimes it's like, whoo, it's not so joyful, <laughs> right? You got to go to the store, and you got to do this, and you got to get this going, and you got to be at that party, and you got to do, and what was supposed to be an exciting, fun time, whoo, where's you down? Next thing you know, you're like, oh, I need a nap. It even becomes stressful, now, the reality, though, in life is that sometimes life gets not just stressful, but there's a place. This man was in distress. The enemies had gathered around. They were going to destroy him, and therefore, hypothetically speaking, would have destroyed God's kingdom and his purposes for Jerusalem and the temple altogether. And it looks like he's complicit because he has absolutely no confidence in God. He has no confidence in what God has said. He's not going with God. He's going with his own wisdom. And it's leading him to a path of destruction. It, it, <clears throat> it had not occurred to him that perhaps the God who established the kingdom could protect his kingdom. You know, today in the United States, we hear the, the, the phrase, make America great again. And I, I'm all for that. But, but what many fail to realize is it's really not uh, just a constitution or uh, capitalism or free market economy or all those things that make America great in this nation. It's really, over the last couple hundred years, God bringing uh, at least two great awakenings, three revivals, right, to the hearts of people who get to places of distress, where even the President of the United States has to roll out on a second inaugural address and preach right out of Isaiah to the whole nation because of the distress uh, that's upon our nation. And then God in his providence grants wisdom and grace and pulls us out and gets us going another season to another revival. And it is about the interaction of God with man. And one of the awesome things about this season, about Christmas, is it really is about God giving us 
hope and life and joy. All those things that we sing about and we talk about are found in Christ. It is a great time to recognize the gift that God has given through his son, Jesus Christ. And it's for us that are Christians, it's an awesome opportunity if we stay on point and don't get stressed and distressed to, to bring forth life and light to people in the world in which we have to do. When the prophecy came to Ahaz, it wasn't something that he was looking for, <laughs> but it was something that he needed. Amen? Ever God ever do that in your life? You're not like looking for a word from God, but all of a sudden he brings it. <laughs> Sometimes it's like a jab. I needed that. Thank you. I could have had a V8, right? So it's like, <laughs> it's like, okay. So Ahaz is moving through life and God says, hey, I got a word for you, Ahaz. Because no matter what you think you're doing, you're messing with my kingdom. I am the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You're just a king. And so uh, it was a sign that God wanted to give to him, a sign of hope, a sign of help. Why? Because, well, Ahaz was going the wrong way. I know what that's like. One time I was at Tippins, in the, back when they had a Tippins in Independence on Nolan Road, so it's many moons ago, but fortunately before I was a pastor. And... Uh, I had a moment of distress. I went into this room. I had to use the restroom. That's the room. And as I looked for the urinal, I found none. And it was about that time that I just had this overwhelming rush of, of uh, you know, you get that fight, flight, or whatever. It's just like adrenaline. Oh, my gosh. Help. Right? There's a, there was a sign when I saw no urinals. I was in the wrong place. I needed to turn around and go the other way. And so, fortunately, I did. And as I came out, woo, you know, I looked up, and guess what I saw? A sign that said men's room right across the way. And I learned something that day, that signs are useful, especially when you're going the wrong way. And so God wants to give Ahaz a sign. He wants him to go the right direction in his infinite grace and mercy. He wants to provide for him a way that's right. And so, you know, by the way, I still look for those signs. Yesterday, we, we had a chance to go to the movies and see Star Wars. Somehow we got in. And afterward, we had to uh, use the restroom. It was this toilet talk. It always makes everybody happy. And uh, I'm with Elizabeth. But the doors of the, the, the restrooms were wide open. And it's like, you know, it's like a dog that's been hit, right? Now that I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like don't, I don't want to make the same mistake twice. I've been burnt once. So I made sure this time before we went in the restroom, I'm looking for the sign. Because I don't want to go the wrong way. Uh, I think, you know, because don't, don't, don't count on one being the left or the right. They'll mix them up on you. Next thing you know, you're in the wrong one. So you got to look, you got to look to the sign. Now, we know, we know, 1 Corinthians, we understand that Jews require a sign, Greeks seek after wisdom. Now, in the context, we are talking about a Jew, Ahaz, who could have used a sign. Uh, one of the signs that he was getting was he was disobedient and his enemies were overflowing his kingdom. That's a sign. Now, we obviously look to the word of God. We are, uh, we are to look for truth in God's word and God provides that for us. Uh, but still, in distress, God gives us indications and, and warnings and things that we need to pay attention to. You see, Ahaz had the word of God and he simply chose to ignore the word of God. He had the prophet Isaiah uh, Isaiah had been around since his grandfather Uzziah was on the throne. And so, Uzziah, so he had access to prophets. He had access to the word of God. And yet he chose. He chose not to follow God's word. And that's why he was in distress. And so the Christmas story is really about meeting God, or no, or God meeting us, I should say, where we're at. That really, when you boil it down, it's about a humanity that's gone off the tracks. And God says, you know what? I'm going to meet them where they're at. Long before Matthew 18, or chapter 1, verses 18 through 23, God had spoken of his incarnation here in this passage. And long before Isaiah 7, 14, God spoke of his incarnation in the garden after the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, 15. In both places, God was speaking to people, well, people that were in distress, people like Ahaz, they did not really know which way to go, who were just compiling sin upon sin and problem upon problem and digging a hole so deep there was no way they could ever get out of it. And it's about that time when there seems like there would be no hope that God meets Ahaz. 
Isn't that incredible? God is so good. After the fall in the garden, God promised Satan that he'd be crushed to the seat of a woman and the incarnation of his deity would come forth. Ahaz, in complete military distress, as Rezin, the king of Syria, and, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, joined forces, his own brethren, uh, with their enemies in Syria to destroy Ahaz and Judah altogether and replace him with another king. In 2 Chronicles 28, which we read earlier, you can go on and find an account where over 200,000 women and children had been taken captive by the reign of Judah. So not only was he in distress, but all the people which he governed were in distress. And everybody was stressful and stressed out. The only reason they returned home is because the enemies had enough wisdom to say, we, don't, we can't handle all these refugees, we need to send them back before the judgment of God falls upon us. Ahaz had raided the temple and paid the king of the Assyrians uh, to do his protective bidding for him. Again, putting himself further and further in debt. And don't be surprised when God shows up before you clean up. There's no indication as we read, or you read the account of Ahaz, that he even repented. Which just shows and continues to show us how awesome God is and how gracious he is and how merciful he is. And how he's calling all men everywhere. As, as uh, Paul said in Acts 17, the repentance. He's calling us to fall upon his grace. And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 1, And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah. By the way, Uzziah and, and, and Jotham weren't bad. They had, he had good examples, but he chose not to follow them. He finds out that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved, and the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. They were swaying. Then said the Lord to Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shir Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted, for the two tails of the smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria and the son of Remaliah, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. God says, This is not going to happen. Put your faith in me. Put your confidence in me. I have plans for Israel. I have plans for Judah. I have plans for the Temple Mount. I have plans for this kingdom. Ahaz, would you get a clue? You're, you need to stop what you're doing and listen and quit doing the same thing over and over and follow me. And he's, he's, he's giving him an opportunity through the prophet Isaiah. In Second Chronicles, it's all accounted in detail. So don't be surprised when God shows up before you clean up. I mean, there's times God will meet you. I mean, he'll meet you right where you are at. I can remember when I was a lost person, hung over, sleeping in my own vomit, walking home, going, I wasn't even old enough to drive. I'm going, God, are you talking to me? Yeah, A has. I wasn't even saved yet. It's interesting when we're in distress, we, all of a sudden we start looking to God. Even lost people. Oftentimes we'll look to God. I remember I was challenged, I was preaching at the mission one time, and this guy comes up. Because I was, be, I mean, I'm preaching it. This is God's word. He talks to us through his word. We talk to him in prayer. You need to listen to his word. And I'm just going on and on. And amen and amen. That's all true. Then after the message, I, you always get the tough questions at City Union Mission, man. These guys have, have a lot of time and wherever they are in the pen or out in the street to think about these things. Come out and says, are you telling me the only way that God can talk to me is through the Bible? I'm thinking, well, God's God. He can do anything he wants, can't he? I said, okay, I'll revise my statement. God can talk to you any way he wants. He would rather talk to you through the Bible. But if you have to go out here on the street and get shot or wrap your car around a telephone pole or do something stupid so that he gets your attention, he can do that too. He can use your circumstances to communicate. 
But you know what's true when it comes from this book. And sometimes circumstances are what God will allow to happen so people will listen to the message. It's at Christmas time, oftentimes, not in this room, because we're all full of the joy of the Lord. But outside, when you go and you're here and you're there, you're like a mighty army of joy going forth, right? The joy of the Lord is your strength. And you're like ambassadors for Christ that go out and you share the good news of Christ in a time when oftentimes people at this time of year are in distress. They've lost loved ones and they can't get over it because there's no hope in Christ. They're going through financial straits and they can't catch up with the supposed uh, you know, joy of the season, right? They can't spend enough and they can't catch up and they, can't, and they just feel more depressed. Hey, man, that's the time when we need to come with the true gospel and say, you know what? The gospel is not in the things that we possess, but in the one who possesses us. The Lord Jesus Christ, he loves us. You are valuable and you don't have to do anything to earn his grace. He loves you. So the Christmas story is all about God meeting us where we're at. In 2 Chronicles, <clears throat> or don't be surprised when he, he shows up before you clean up. Now, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 4, you'd expect God to show up and say, Ahaz, you are a loser. I am going to destroy you because you're not cooperating with me. But instead, he offers him words of comfort and grace. Check that out. He says, and say unto him, take heed and be quiet. Hey, Haz, would you just shut up and sit down? Just take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted. For two tails of these smoking firebrands, for fierce anger of resin with Syrian, and he just goes right through it. And he, and, and he doesn't mince words. He goes, I got this. Would you just sit underneath my word? Would you rest in what I have to say? This was not because Ahaz is a, a great guy at all. It's because Jotham, the father of Ahaz, was a good man. And Uzziah was a good man. But it wasn't because uh, anything to do with Ahaz. If you have your Bible, turn back to first, or 2 Kings, I'm sorry, 2 Kings chapter 15. Second Kings chapter 15, in verse 32, you see this account. It says, In the second year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, began Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty years old was he, when, was he when he began to reign, and he reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was uh, Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Pretty good report, right? It's kind of like a PK, right? An MK, Christian kid raised up in church. His folks did that which was right. But what happened to Ahaz? Well, I don't know. Turn over to chapter 16. Chapter 16 of 2 Kings. You see, the Lord had already spoken to Isaiah Isaiah 6, 1, in the year that Uzziah died, came forth this incredible prophecy, Isaiah 6, 11 through 13. And he, let, he already let Isaiah know, Israel's going to be destroyed. The times of the Gentiles will commence. Of course, we know from retrospect that happened with Babylon's invasion, 606 B.C. Israel was taken out in 500 B.C. Uh, five, I forget the exact, I think it was 586. So God executed that. But at this time, it hadn't come to pass. And God was wanting to work with the people in Israel. And, and so the, God had already, the die was cast. But even though the die was cast, it wasn't time to quit serving the Lord. It was time to continue to serve the Lord in obedience. After, after Ahaz would come Hezekiah, who was a great king. After Hezekiah would come Josiah, men who were remnants, who were faithful, who were part of God's promise to always have a remnant in Israel. And so uh, it, it, there's a faithful remnant that God promises to preserve. So Isaiah shows up with his son, Shear Jashub, whose name actually means the remnant that shall return. That's what his son's name means. It's a strange thing. Hey, go take your son and go take, talk to Ahaz. Why? Because his name means a remnant shall return. 
Even though the prophecy had gone forth in Isaiah chapter 6, God is letting King Ahaz know, listen, it's not over for you yet, Ahaz. Follow me. Rest in me. I still have purposes. I'll still protect you. I will still keep you. You see, the problem with Ahaz was that he was a bankrupt man. When you look at 2 Kings, verse 1, it says, And in the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem like his father. And he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord, his God, like David, his father. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Yea, and he made, for his, and he made his sons... Look at this. To pass through the fire according to the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. Does anybody know what that means? That he made his sons to be passed through the fire? Yeah, he sacrificed his sons. He, he, he took his sons down and he, gave, he killed his own sons for pagan gods. That's the kind of guy we're talking about. He's not a good guy. He's not the kind of guy you would expect God to want to address. But yet, God speaks to him. The Bible goes on to say, in the verse 4, And he sacrificed burnt incense in high places and on, every, and on the hills under every green tree, which we already read about in Isaiah. We already understand that is who this guy is. He is a man who is a bankrupt man. He's bankrupt morally. He doesn't have anything. Maybe you've been Christmas shopping, right? And you say, man, I'm bankrupt. But you haven't even gotten close to Ahaz. You see, Ahaz was bankrupt morally. He burned his kids in these fires to Molech, like the pagans that lived all around him, hoping that it would garner him what? Power. When he is the most powerful man on the planet because of the office in which he sits, representing the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the nation of Israel on the throne in Jerusalem, there is no greater seat to be in on this planet because in God's prophetic timetable, that's where Jesus is going to rule and reign his kingdom. And he should have known that. And yet, he's off burning his kids to pagan gods. Now look at verse 5. Then Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came to Jerusalem to war. They're not scared. And they besieged Ahaz, but you know what? They couldn't overcome him. Why is that, I wonder? Because God said, no, you're not doing that. They couldn't overcome him. They couldn't overcome Jerusalem. It says in verse 7, or verse 6, At that time, Rezin, king of Syria, recovered Elath to Syria. That's all the way down by the Persian Gulf. And he drave, or not the Persian Gulf, but the Red Sea. And he drove the Jews from Elath. And the Syrians came to Elath and dwelt there uh, unto this day. So Ahaz sent messengers, Tiglath Pilzer, king of Assyria, saying, check this out. I am thy servant and thy son. I just want to pause right there. So this king, sitting in the stead of David's lineage, says to this, this pagan king, uh, and he sends it to Assyria, which is modern-day Iraq, or it would become eventually the kingdom of Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, I am thy servant. I am thy, what's he say? Son. God's like, no, you're not. What are you saying? You give yourself over to them? I got a prophecy for you because I've got a son and he's coming soon. Don't give yourself over to the world. God is meeting him where he's at saying, listen, Ahaz, you, you are taking a wrong road. You are going down a path of no return. You are, you are calling yourself a son of the king of Assyria, a servant of, of, the, of the enemies of God. What is wrong with you? He says, come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. And God says, Isaiah, would you go intercept him? What in the world does he think he's doing? And look what he does in verse 8. And Ahaz took the silver and the gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house and sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria hearkened unto him for the king of Assyria went up against Damascus and took it and carried the people of it captive to Ker and slew Rezin. 
and I won't read the rest. You can go on. What he ends up doing gives you details about how he took the pattern and he, he changes the temple and he changes the temple mount and he moves everything around. He rearranges it and he ends up offering sacrifices to pagan gods on the temple mount. Abomination, right? Like an abomination of desolation type of antichrist. And so he's up there and he's offering these, these sacrifices. And he's, he, then he goes, like it says in Isaiah and in and, and, uh, and Second Chronicles, and he goes out and he distributes worship under every green tree. And he says, no, we're going to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the Lord has commanded and coming to Jerusalem and doing what he said to do. And we're going to go out and we're going to just worship anywhere we want under every green tree to every god with a small g we can find, hoping to garner favor with the king of Assyria so that we can fight our enemies. You see, what he's, digging, he's doing is he's giving away the treasures. He's sealing up the doors of the temple. He's, he, what he's doing is he's turning his back on God and he is just paying his way out of trouble. And guess what he's doing? He's just getting in debt. With interest and more interest and more interest. And he's not trusting the one who got him there. Maybe you've been bankrupt and in debt. Ahaz is bankrupt religiously. He's only, he has forsaken God as he's retrofit the temple. And he just figures this you know what? If I can't beat him, I might as well join him. Maybe God's brought you here today and you're kind of there. You come into a church and you don't speak the language. You don't know the protocol. You don't even feel like this is your place. But I got news for you. It is your place. It's the place that God has for you. It's a path that he wants you to take. And I, and I like God. I want to meet you where you're at. And get you where you need to go. Because I guarantee you, when you just go on and go on and go on with this life, when you go on down the, the road in this world, listen, you're going to keep digging a hole that gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And let me tell you, the only one that can save you is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we have Christmas. Because he's the gift of eternal life. Despite Ahaz's wickedness, God still gives him a sign. He gives him a clue. He says, hey... Get a clue, Ahaz, let me help you out of this mess. Instead of going to Assyria, instead of giving the gold out of the temple, instead of rearranging the temple mount and worshiping pagan gods and sacrificing your own children and putting blood on your hands and making your conscience so heavy with the weight of sin that you can't even get out of bed in the morning, so you got to take another drink, another drug, another something else just to pacify your conscience. Listen, let me send you a word from God. Listen, trust in me. Trust in me, rest, get quiet and sit down with no fear. Believe that I am who I said I am. First he has Isaiah meet him. Go back to Isaiah, please, in chapter 7. Look at this text. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shear Jashub, thy son. Which Remember, his name means the remnant shall return. Give him an illustration so he can understand this thing. This is my son, Shir Jashub. He would have said, oh, nice to meet you, a remnant shall return. <laughs> Message. McFly, right, wake up. He says, take him down there. And then he says in verse 4, and I say, or not verse 4, stay in verse 3. He says, this is where I want you to meet him. At the end of the conduit of the upper pool. In the highway of the Fuller's Field. Very specific. Don't just go meet him somewhere. This is where I want you to meet Ahaz. Isaiah, please go meet the king now. First, Isaiah has to meet him at the end of the conduit. Of the upper pool. The word upper, if you look it up in the Bible, like over 30 times, the word upper, not the pool part, but the upper, it refers to God in his glory. Exalted. Upper pool. Go down to the end of the conduit. See, don't come to your end without seeing the end of the line, Ahaz. Because you're in the line in the lineage of David. And God has made promises to your family. And you're in a pipeline leading to someone called the Messiah. I'm about to tell you about him in chapter 7 and verse 14. And you need to understand this, Ahaz. You're making a wrong turn. You're making a wrong decision. You're going the wrong way. If you go back to Matthew 1.16, and we don't have time to, to see it, you'll see, in, uh, or you'll, actually in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 9, you'll see Ahaz mentioned there in the lineage leading up to verse 16 to Joseph. 
And it is the end of the line that he needs to focus on. At the end of the conduit, what's going to come forth? What's coming forth out of the end of that line? That's right, there's a spigot of water. The water of life is flowing. Ahaz, you're in this pipeline. You need to realize what's coming. You need to stay faithful. He takes him to the end of the conduit. Jesus is the water of life. He's the king of kings. And he, he met the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He told her that he was the water of life. She believed him and many came to faith in Samaria. The very same people who joined forces with Syria to destroy Jerusalem. Jesus would come forth. And about 700 years after this, and he would stand in that area and he would proclaim, I am the water of life. And the very people that were God's enemies end up believing on him, at least for a short season, until they rejected him. Jesus is the end of the line, beloved. You don't need to look to the left. You don't need to look to the right. You don't need to look down. You don't need to look up. He is everything you need. He is everything I need. He's everything that we need. There's nowhere else to go but to Jesus. He is, he, is the, he is the one that comes forth from the pool above. He is the water of life. He's the one that we drink from. Literally, it, when Jesus sp spoke to the woman at the well, he said in John 4.10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, Merry Christmas, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Jesus Christ is, is, is bringing a conduit through the very line of Ahaz, and he's going to bring forth the water of life freely. And he says, Isaiah, go down and meet this man and get him on board because he doesn't know what he's missing. The gift of eternal life through the water of the word. Notice where the conduit ends in verse 3. He says it's not just going to the end of the conduit, but it's down at the, at the, the, the upper pool. Is in the, the, the conduit that comes from the upper pool, it's in the highway of the fuller's field. See, there's a highway. A highway is an elevated causeway or a path leading to the fuller's field. Just like today, you go out here on I-49 and most of the highways are what? They're elevated. You know, they don't want them in a floodplain, so they usually elevate a highway. He says, go down to the, to the highway of the fuller's field. By the end of that conduit from the upper pool... And speak to Ahaz. Why? Because God wants to send him a message. And that message, we all know from Proverbs 16, 25, the Spirit of God calling. And he's saying, Ahaz, re repent of this foolish worship. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. You're hurting yourself. You're hurting the nation of Israel. Proverbs 16, 7, the same chapter says, The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. In John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Come to the highway that leads to the fuller's field, a place to, well, wash clothes. That's what a fuller is. It's not Sam Fuller or Christy Fuller. Though they are fullers. This is a different fuller's field. It's not the one that they own. It's the one that, that, where they would go down and wash clothes. Even today, like if you go to Nepal, they'll use the river water to wash your clothes. It's really not good, actually. Because it's got dead people floating in it. They're ashes, so it stinks. But that's a whole other story. The clothes don't get quite as white there as they did here. The point of the fuller, though, is to make the clothes white. To get the clothes clean. And he's calling upon this man. This man who has sacrificed his own children to pagan gods. He's calling on him to go to the fuller's field and make his clothes white. Because he's got blood on his hands. He needs to be purified. His people need to be purified. They're dirty and they're filthy. And it's making God angry. And God is saying, Ahaz, would you stop it? And would you believe in me? Would you follow me? In the book of Isaiah, chapter 1 and verse 18. The very beginning of the book of Isaiah. The prophecy of Isaiah. God says this. He says, come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Man, isn't that a beautiful passage? God, only God, is able to take a, a pit that's so deep, 
a guilt that is so heavy, a burden that is so despicable, where you kill your own children and he's able to communicate, listen, just rest in me. I will take you from the, I will bring you water from, the, from on high from the upper pool. I will cleanse you. I will give you what you need to drink. I will take you on a highway of righteousness to the fuller's field and I will cleanse you of all your unrighteousness and all the blood that you shed. Amen? Amen. There's some of you, I know there's some, even in our church that are, they need that verse. Whether it's abortion or murder or just our own conscience knowing that we have turned on a holy God and we have said, crucify him. God still says, hey, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll cleanse you. I'll give you what you need. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Take heed, be quiet, fear not. Because God's on the case even when you are a case. And God meets us where we are so we can see what we need to see. Because ultimately, and you can read this whole text on your own, but when you finally boil it down, God's leading him to Isaiah chapter seven and verse 14. He says, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign, Ahaz. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, here's your sign. Here's your sign. God with us. God not only met Ahaz where he was at, he met humanity where he was at. Emmanuel, God with us. I never thought about this before, but you, you know what would happen to his son, Hezekiah? He would be in almost the exact same predicament. And he would be in a situation, the same prophet comes to him, the same situation, and he could have went somewhere else but he chose not to. And he takes the prophecy and he rolls it out and he prays it back before the Lord. And literally, the angel of the Lord, the pre incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, shows up with a sword and whips Sennacherib's tail, sends him all the way back to Assyria, all by himself. You know what happened? The Lord showed up. There are times when the only solution is the Lord Jesus Christ and the situation is so desperate that you have to trust the word of God. That's how you get saved. That's how you walk. That's how we should be in this life. Despite Ahaz's wickedness, God still gives him a clue how to get out of the mess. He met him at the end of the conduit of the upper pool. Don't come to your end without seeing the end. He gets him to the place where he can see what he needs to see, and he sees this sign. And this morning, there's only one thing that you may need to do. Despite your sin, despite your poor decisions, God meets every one of us where we're at with the Lord Jesus Christ. The same promise he gave to Adam, the same promise he gives to Ahaz, and Judah, as he's giving to us this morning that he has the gift of eternal life and it's in his son. It's in the incarnation. Would you receive that sign? And then he mentions a son. Notice in verse 14, something that'll tie us to chapter nine and verse six. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a, notice this, a son, a son, and call his name Emmanuel. We're gonna, he's gonna, he's, we're gonna give you a son. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. This is none other, of course, than Mary, prophesied 700 years before Jesus appeared. Joseph receives his name and he see, receives this prophecy, as we read earlier this morning in Matthew 1.21. And she shall bring forth, it says, a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus. That, that's the same word as Joshua, right? The Savior of Israel. There's a Savior coming. There's a Savior coming, and he's a son. Unto us, a son who shall bring victory to an oppressed people. Turn to Isaiah 9, 6. Notice this. You guys have probably heard this a million times. Grace Slick used to sing about it. For unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There's no missing the placement of this prophecy. In the midst of war, there comes forth a son. These prophecies are loaded with, with discussions of war and destruction. And In the midst of all of these prophecies, there's a son. 
There's a son, and this son is a savior. He brings forth a victory to the oppressed people. He has a government. He'll bear the weight of the world's government on his shoulders in the millennium. He'll bear the weight of our sin on the cross. He's a son whose name is Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He is God with us. And this son was prophesied by God himself in Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. This son is good news to us who receive him and bad news to those who won't. God chose to reveal a sign to a corrupt king which was an ancient promise that he had made 3,300 years earlier in the garden after the fall. Unto us... Adam's fallen race would be given a son. In his humanity is all the lineage of David through his mother. That is why the prophecy in Isaiah 7, 14 is so specific. A virgin shall come forth. A virgin, gift-wrapped, the son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. God with us, Emmanuel, the promise of salvation spelled out the doom of Satan. It's no wonder that there was so much war rotating around these two prophecies. It's no wonder there was so much problem going on around this issue. Because God had given a sign and he had promised a son. And all the way back in the garden, this was a son that would be a savior. As he looks and he says, Satan, I know what you've done to my people. I know what you've done to the human race and I'm coming for you through the weakness of a woman. You went after the weak link and guess what? It's going to be from her that your end will come. Thou shalt, I'm going to bruise my heels, I stomp on your head. And you can count on it. I'm prophesying it right now. And you want to look into it further? I'm coming through David. You want to look into it further? I'm coming down the line. Here I come. Isaiah 7, 14. I'm a coming. Oh, you want to know more? You think it's getting dark? You think you're going to take over the kingdom? Hey, guess what? You're going to think you've won. For 400 years, there's silence. There's nothing. It looks like he's won. And then, bing, the light comes on. And guess what we have? A son. A son. Turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 9. We're just about done. Luke 2, 9. As Jesus comes, to the, as the angel comes to the shepherds, it says, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the Glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Notice what the, the angel says in verse 10. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. Same thing he told Ahaz. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to some people. All people. All people. All people. For unto us, or for unto you, is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Amen? Amen. So from Genesis to Revelation, Jesus is the Savior. When Satan is being addressed in the garden, God promises the doom of Satan as, as, uh, through this weaker vessel, and he is destroyed. In Luke 3.38, when you go over there and look, as you go through the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ, it comes all the way down to, to verse 38, which says, He was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. You see what's happened through eternity. What's happened in time is we are in a, a great conflict between light and dark, good and evil, principalities and powers, and God is in the garden, and he's saying, Listen, devil, you have destroyed my son. You have destroyed the human race through Adam's sin. I promise you, I'm coming for you. And I'm coming as a son. And that's exactly what happened as he came to this earth. He came as a man. He was God with skin on. He became flesh and dwelt among us. Not just to save Israel, though he has a plan and he is going to save Israel. He will rule and reign in Jerusalem. He will administrate his government. And the increase of, their, of that will be no end. Uh, that's what Isaiah 9, 6 says. And that's why we understand the colons, right? <clears throat> and so we get that. But he didn't just come to save Israel. He didn't just come to save David's kingdom. He didn't just come to take care of Abraham and his lineage. He came, listen to me, beloved. He came as a gift to all people. And he says it to the shepherds. He says, listen, this is a gift that all of us get in on. He, he's going to be great joy, which shall be to all people. 
Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Why? <clears throat> because he knew that maybe today you're in a place where you've dug a hole so deep, you've gotten in debt so far, you've got so much blood on your hands that you feel like you can't get out. You feel like the only thing you can do is just leverage and leverage and leverage yourself to the point that you have no more hope. And if you can't beat them, you might as well join them. And through the darkness, God busts through. From, from the pool on high, from, from an endless fountain in heaven, he busts through through a conduit named the Lord Jesus Christ, through the word of God. He's actually bringing you a message like Isaiah intercepted Ahaz. And he says, listen, don't go there. God has a better thing for you. He wants you to take this highway, this road of righteousness to the fuller's field. And he wants you to be forgiven of all your sin. Why? Because Jesus is a gift for all people. And he loves you this morning. He loves me this morning. Only God, who is all-powerful and all-knowing, could use his weakness to overthrow the strength of the enemy. He didn't come in like a bad boy like he will in Revelation 19. He comes in as a child. It's unbelievable. He doesn't just get up on the cross and say, death to everybody that doesn't follow me. He dies in their stead. And just like he didn't go to Ahaz and say, you're done, Ahaz. He says, hey, Ahaz, would you listen to me before you can't? God is merciful and kind. And it's when we come to Christmas that we see that through the gift, the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. He gave him for us, for me, for you. So that 33 and a half years later, he could die in our place on the cross, the only acceptable sacrifice for sin, the only way to redeem the entire race that was lost in Genesis 3. And beloved, that's why we celebrate Christmas, because that's the story of Christmas. In the midst of a war between good and evil came forth a son a light of the world, and his promises are true. No matter how far you've dug the hole, no matter how bloody your hands are, when you call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says you are saved. But you can't be like Ahaz and just continue in doing what you want to do. There has to come a point where you recognize that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Would you come to him today? Heavenly Father, as we conclude this time...